So Marjorie Taylor Greene beat them after all, and she knows it. Uh, she tweeted out this morning that she literally woke up laughing. And I kind of smiled when I saw that because she's right. She won. Now, on the first glance, you might say, wait a minute, Dinesh, uh, what do you mean she won? The Democrats voted, and here was the vote, uh, 230 to 199, to kick her off her two committees. But as Marjorie Greene herself pointed out, when you're in the minority, being on a committee doesn't count for much. The Democrats, the majority party in the House, really controls the agenda of those committees. So this was a kind of symbolic gesture. Now, here's the key point. How many Republicans voted to boot Marjorie Taylor Greene? This was really the key issue from the beginning. Would the Republican Party sell her out? And the answer is no, it didn't. Uh, 10 Republicans, no, 11 Republicans voted um, against her. And uh, here they are. This is the kind of dishonorable role. Carlos Jimenez, Mark Jacobs, John Katko, Young Kim, disappointing there. Adam Kinzinger, predictable. Nicole Maliotakis, Maria Elvarez Salazar, Mario Diaz-Balart, both from Florida, Chris Smith of New Jersey, Fred Upton and Brian Fitzpatrick. Now, this is pretty much the same crew that voted against Trump, so it doesn't come as a surprise. But by and large, think of it, there are some 220 or so Republicans in the House, and the vast, vast majority of them hung together. Uh, and the leadership didn't sell her out. Now, we need to back up here because when I started talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene and brought her on this podcast, it was reported that Kevin McCarthy, the GOP leader in the House, was negotiating with the Democrats to kick her off one committee if they would agree not to bring it before the House floor. So he was essentially arranging, according to reports, a kind of partial sellout. And this is the Republican default position. They always go to this. How, how, how can we control the damage and you know, beat up on our own side, but not too much? And it's the accomplishment of the Democrats. It's one thing for them to cancel us, but to get us to cancel ourselves is real triumph. And they're really good at this. And we are really bad at it. Uh, but I think that our podcast right here and you uh, had uh, an impact. Why? Because at the end of the podcast, I called upon you to call Kevin McCarthy's office and tell him, don't sell this woman out. Why? Because the fact of the matter is, and you can see it for yourself, she's not a kook. Uh, it may be that in the past she entertained opinions. You know, there were some all kinds of speculation, for example, after the Las Vegas shooting. How come we've heard nothing about it? And it is strange. This was a horrendous shooting. We've heard nothing about it. It's almost like the event never happened. And so, yeah, all kinds of weird speculations began. And maybe she traded in them and shared them. So what? So what? The principle at stake is really clear. Are we, the Republicans, going to allow the other side to choose who sits on Republican slots on congressional committees? This is outrageous. Reminds me of a scene in the movie Beckett where uh, Beckett is confronted by, a, pre, by a, a bishop who says, you better stand up for the church. And a priest has been accused of some kind of being a kind of malefactor and Beckett goes, well, is he, is he guilty? Is he guilty? And the bishop tells him, it doesn't matter if he's guilty. The real issue is, shouldn't he be tried in the ecclesiastical courts? That's the issue, preserving the right of the clergy to try their own. If Marjorie Taylor Greene has committed some horrendous offense, Republicans can figure that out. They can deal with her. But this idea of letting Democrats have a say-so on who serves on Republican seats on committees absolutely horrific. And so the argument I made was, look, listen, they have the power to do it to us, but we might soon have the power to do it to them. The midterm elections are coming up. Let's start throwing some Democrats off their committees if we take the House. So we're going to teach them a bitter lesson, kind of the way we've done with the Supreme Court, with the filibuster. We've learned that when we are treated badly, we should not hesitate to treat them badly in return. Now, coming back to my point about Marjorie Taylor Greene and how she came out ahead. She held her own party. Her own party didn't sell her out. Number two, she's raised a whole bunch of money on this. And I think rightly so. People have rallied to her support. They've realized that her real crime is being an ordinary woman and a Trumpster and a patriot and being outspoken and unafraid. And she's a fighter. 
That's what scares the left. Same thing that scares them about Trump. But finally, Marjorie Taylor Greene has emerged from this as being an extremely well-known person. She's become a national figure. Now think of how hard that is to do when you're a freshman congresswoman. By and large, most people serve 10 terms in Congress and no one knows who they are. It reminds me kind of that scene in Evita where, where Perón is talking about his generals and Evita goes, most of your generals wouldn't be recognized by their own grandmothers. And this is true of most people in Congress. Can you name 10 members of Congress? I can't. Can you name your own congressman? I can, but most of us can't. We don't know who these people are, but we do know who Marjorie Taylor Greene is. And so suddenly, in a weird way, this Democratic blitzkrieg, this assault against her, has enlarged her reputation, has made her profile. It allows her now, and she's liberated. She doesn't, she doesn't owe anything to anybody. She can become a powerful fighter and a powerful spokeswoman on behalf of her principles. So congratulations, Marjorie Taylor Greene. You beat them at their own game. Keep fighting.